the Winchester house. <clears throat> okay, the origin of this story begins with the invention of one of the finest rifles in history, one of the best firearms, one of the best well-known firearms in history. Many innovations of earlier rifles led to the invention of the Henry rifle, which led to the invention of, you know, which then led to the invention of the Winchester model 1866. Oliver Winchester owned the company that developed the Winchester from the Henry. Millions of the various Winchester models were sold across the globe. It was one of the most famous and successful rifle designs of all time. Anytime you've seen the old the old cowboy movies with the lever action rifle, yeah, that's probably a Winchester. Maybe a Henry, but probably a Winchester. Firearms magnate William Wirt Winchester, he was the treasurer of the Winchester Repeating Arms Company, married Sarah Lockwood. <clears throat> when her husband and mother-in-law passed away, Sarah Lockwood Winchester inherited $20 million and a 50% holding in the company. Sarah, always called Sally, felt overwhelming guilt for the deaths inflicted by the rifle. She felt that her husband and thereby herself were guilty for having caused these deaths. I don't know how anyone could think that, but there you go. Sally owned a mansion in San Jose, California. <clears throat> Here's where the details get a little fuzzy. For every story that says one thing, another story claims something else. Many of these stories directly contradict each other. So I, when I was doing research for this, I went through story after story after story, like 20 of them, I think. And I tried to find details that were common in all of them, or at least most of them. And so here we go. Here's what we do know. Sally was an enthusiast who listened to mediums. That may have been where the guilt for the rifles came from. I'm not sure. One of them, one of these mediums, told her that the ghosts of the victims of Winchester firearms were following her. And the only way to divert them was to confuse them somehow. Evidently, the woman believed that she could get them lost in her house and be rid of them. Sally also believed that once construction was finished on her house, she was going to die. Mediums had a huge sway over people back in the day. <coughs> and they preyed upon these rich people. That you got to keep them coming back so you can milk more money out of them. Now, I don't know if this medium was real or not, if she had powers or not, but regardless of what I believe, Sally believed them. Sally began adding to her mansion, constructing hallways to nowhere, doors that opened into walls, rooms with no exits, doors and windows that opened into nothing. There, it's a bell tower that was rumored to be used to summon spirits. Other maze-like features. Sally was obsessed with the number 13 and held nightly seances. Um, there's a number of different stairwells in the house that have 13 steps. There's a number of rooms that have 13 windows. Uh, it, you know, it, it's just crazy. After Sally's death in 1922, the house became a tourist attraction for its gothic architecture and curious features. Over the years, the house was used in films and as a basis for Disney rides. <clears throat> a movie was made about it starring Helen Mirren. And if you've not seen it, I, I have not seen that movie. But Helen Mirren is good in anything she's in. She's one of my favorite actresses. She is, anything she's in is worth doing and she does it well. She's one of the best actresses on the planet. And she's hot as hell. My contention is, watch the movie. That's all I'm saying. Over the years since Sally began the construction frenzy and even after her death, visitors have reported all manner of apparitions, sounds, shadows, and even physical encounters with entities that can only be described as otherworldly. People see dark shapes and shadows moving through the halls. Visitors report seeing ghostly apparitions in several rooms. Uh, tourists report having or hearing whispers, footsteps, and windows and doors being slammed. I, they report smelling food cooking and feeling cold spots. There's one room, apparently, where people smell cigar smoke. I don't know what that's about. Well, maybe Sally smokes cigars. I don't know. 
Several tourists report being shoved or grabbed by non-existent assailants. So, there's one one story of a lady. She's with the tour, and she's you know she's at last in line, and she's getting ready to go down the stairs to follow the group, and something shoved her from behind, and she fell into the crowd. Luckily, she fell into people, you know. And <clears throat> again, I'm I'm going with the with the information that was common in the different articles that I read. Again, a lot of this stuff, a lot of these articles contradicted each other. So there's a lot of this stuff you've probably heard that I'm leaving out of this. If you know something, or if you if you know something from a reputable source, please put it in the comments. I'm sure people would love to read it. Mediums who have visited the house have counted over a thousand different spirits within. Um, several mediums ran from the house and refused to return. The Sally Winchester house is rumored, rumored to be the most haunted house in America, possibly the world. And if the, if the medium was correct, if she had power and she knew and she was truthful, then Sally was being haunted by millions of spirits. And the only way to get them off of her was to confuse them, which is the reason she built this, these additions to her mansion. Then it's possible there are thousands of thousands and thousands, maybe even millions of spirits trapped in this house because they're too confused to find a way out. You see what I'm saying? I don't. I again, I can't verify any of that's true. But if the story holds and it, and it holds with what people are reporting, they see and feel and experience in this house, maybe there's something to it. You never know. Um. Now a little add-on from my opinion a gun is a tool like a hammer or a screwdriver or a or a pencil it is as good or evil as the person using it now it's never good war is never ever good sometimes it's a necessity when you're defending your life and your way of life but war is sometimes a necessity but it's never good it is it should always be the last option now that being said if you're defending your way of life or defending your life your family's life and all you have to defend it with is one of these rifles one of these Winchester rifles yeah I'm gonna defend my life I'm gonna defend my family and if their spirits get pissed off about it oh well <laughs> sorry you know, if somebody comes to your house, they come calling, they set the rules, you play the game, and you want to win the game. It's that simple. And it, I'm not saying it's a game, but that's, you know, they set the rules, you play to win. That's all there is to it. The Monte Cristo Homestead. Located in South Wales, Australia, the mansion was built in 1884 by Christopher William Crawley, C-R-A-W-L-E-Y. In January of 1876, Crawley had purchased 520 acres in that area. He struggled with farming because he, he was, it was difficult to grow stuff there until he got a tip that the railroad was coming into the area. He built a hotel across the road from what would soon be a busy railway station. After the railroad was finished, Crawley's profits soared. He was he was a farmer at the same time he was he was uh, making money from the hotel so yeah he became a, a big person in that area he bought more land and would become one of the town's founders in 1883 in 1884 the mansion was built and uh, Crowley and his wife and their seven children moved in they became the cream of society stories of buried gold caused them no end of trouble they were forever chasing people off the land people for whatever reason people he had taken a payment for something and i don't recall what it was in gold coins and that money was never seen again so people estimated that he that he buried it somewhere on the property or hid it in the house somewhere that kind of thing and they everybody was there looking for it Years after the family had passed on, stories of the atrocities which marked their rule of the house would surface. And these atrocities were really, really bad. Um, 
but the people who were there looking for the gold wouldn't stop either. It, it, I mean, if, if somebody shows up to your house to rob it on a daily basis, I would imagine you probably get pretty guarded, but at the same time, you know, there's, there's, there's guarded and then there's cruelty. For example, a maid was carrying their infant daughter. The maid claimed that an invisible force pushed the baby from her arms. The baby fell, and as I understand it, fell down the stairs and died. Um, I can't imagine what they did to that maid. Crawley himself died at the mansion on December 14, 1910 of heart failure. His wife became a shut-in. She died on August 12, 1933 of a ruptured appendix. Uh, another maid, a young girl, was pushed off a balcony. She was pregnant at the time when she died. This was ruled an accident. One young boy claimed to be too sick to work. The boss, the, the foreman, thought that he was he was lying and he set fire to his straw mattress. The boy couldn't get out of the bed and he burned to death. Uh, the housekeeper's son was mentally retarded and was chained up in an outbuilding for 40 years. When when the housekeeper died, he, nobody checked on him. Nobody knew anything about it. Nobody, nobody bothered to go out and look. So he was found out there several days later. It was it was just nasty. Um, the last Crawley left the house in in the, the residence in 1948, and a caretaker was left in charge. In 1961, a local man had seen the movie Psycho, the horror thriller. He'd seen it three times, and he snapped. He stalked up to the mansion and shot the caretaker dead. This house has seen no end of tragedy and atrocity. The house was purchased in 1963 with the intent of turning it into an antiques business, and that's when the ghost activity really started. They were returning, the, the people who, who bought it were returning from shopping, and they saw light streaming from every doorway and window. No electricity had ever been installed. As they approached, the lights just disappeared something was creating the light in there according to the owners there are at least 10 ghosts haunting monte cristo one may be that of a woman murdered in the house I, gee i can't imagine <coughs> um they've, they've experienced cold spots footsteps disembodied voices heavy breathing they're common occurrences in monte cristo as well as doors opening and closing on their own people have been reported being shoved one was reported being shoved down the stairs. Luckily escaped with very few injuries, but you know, luckily it wasn't fatal. Psychics who have visited the mansion have all independently reported similar experiences. And they're not run of the mill stuff. It's not like, oh, there's a spirit in this house. I sent spirits, you know, like they like the hoaxers do. This was there's a woman sitting in that chair. The, 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 there's a woman over there. There's a young girl over here, that kind of thing. Specifics. Uh Monte Cristo has has long been reported to be one of the most haunted places in Australia, and for my money, it may very well be, it may very well be one of the most haunted places in the world. And again, you have to go back prior to the building of the mansion. What happened there before that? Because it was an untamed land before that. Who, you know, we're, we're, I'm sure the denizens before that before. Western colonization before the the, uh, the Botany Bay Penal Colony was established. Before that, yeah, the 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 I'm sure the denizens of that land were not all peaceful. That's what I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. The Mansfield Reformatory. Uh, this place has a heck of a history. It was open for about a, about a hundred years, uh, and their their records were not kept very diligently so we honestly don't know how many people died here I'll, I'll start from the beginning in 1890 the Mansfield Reformatory also known as the Ohio State Reform Reformatory opened it was an intermediate penitentiary for men and boys aged 16 to 30 prior to the prison the site was a training ground for US Civil War soldiers it was called Camp Mordecai Bartley thousands of people were trained there and it was it was uh 
it was later decided to put a prison there. It took a long time to build it, and they used a lot of uh, a lot of architecture, kind of like a castle from European sources. This prison that they built boasted the world's tallest freestanding cell block. Unfortunately, the height of the cell block was used to push. Un, you know, they were they used that height. They were pushing uh, inmates that weren't liked were pushed off the top. So you know. That, that was a source of, of, it wasn't good. Let's just, let's just put it that way. They built the world's tallest freestanding cell block, and they were using it to murder inmates they didn't like. The, not the, the guards weren't murdering them, other inmates were. So, in the late 1930s, a riot broke out at the prison. The guard, uh, now, <clears throat> the prison was made of stone and steel, so... When they started a big fire, the, the rioters, when they, when the, during the riot, they started a big fire. Rather than do anything about it, the guards just sealed it off. Um, they sealed off the rioters in the cell block, including, and then they also sealed off the ventilation systems, which trapped the fire and the smoke in with the prisoners. <coughs> Excuse me, the guards were sitting around making lists, identifying prisoners, which they felt were behind the riot. They had a hundred, and when it was over, they had a hundred and twenty names. They locked these men in twelve cells of the solitary confinement section because there was only twelve solitary confinement cells. They had a hundred and twenty people that packed them in into a cell to teach them a lesson. The rioters were kept in the hole for a week without food or water, which drove many of them to the point of madness. In the 1960s, the reformatory was getting crowded. Guards were forced to even double up the death row inmates. Um, this caused a lot of fights, and a lot of prisoners ended up dead. In one instance, they had two prisoners, death row inmate prisoners in one cell. The guards came back, and there was only one guy in there, so they pulled him out, and they held him, and they searched the cell. And they found out that the, the other prisoner had murdered him, broke up his body, and stuffed him beneath a bunk. Murders were very common throughout the prison, especially in the showers. Uh, prisoners would be walking through there completely defenseless because you're in the shower. And somebody would reach out and cut them across the belly and the, their, their insides would pour out. Um... Guard, you know, people would get shanked on a daily basis. Other prisoners hardly took notice. It was very, very common. The prison remained in operation until 1990. That's a hundred years of this. Now, even before the prison closed, paranormal activity had been reported. To this day, visitors to the facility report all manner of activity, including being pushed, pulled, <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me, being pushed or pulled, being struck, having their hair pulled. Many have seen dark shadows moving throughout the buildings, and this isn't just in the cell blocks, it's even in the administration buildings. Um, people report hearing footsteps, they hear doors slam, doors have been, have, have been seen slamming in certain areas of the, of the prison. People have heard low growling sounds, disembodied voices. It's, everything a haunting could be is in this place, and rightly so. It was it was active for a hundred years, and nobody. We really don't know how many people were killed here. For a hundred years, some of the worst villains in America were sitting here, and many of them never left. I, I, I'm going to go out of limb and say they're probably a little pissed. Now. If you're a Christian like me, you believe in God. You also believe in the devil. It's the flip side of the same coin. Where there are devils and demons, you have possession. Uh, demonic possession is not being used as a defense in any court cases that I'm aware of because if you let one person do it, soon everybody's doing it. Oh, it wasn't me. I was possessed by the devil. Blah, 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 blah. You know, 
So I understand why it's not happening. But how many people who have been convicted of very serious crimes go to prison with a demon in them? You see what I'm saying? Um, if there are demonic possessions, chances are at least some of them ended up in prison and it would explain a lot of the shit that happens. And it would explain a lot of the low growling sounds that they hear in this place. Imperial Casino Hotel. The Imperial Casino Hotel is in Cripple Creek, Colorado. It was built in 1896. Now, <clears throat> I gotta give you a little bit of background on the town. The town of Cripple Creek was the, the quintessential boomtown. In 1890, gold was discovered in this small gulch, and in a few short years, a town of 25,000 people had sprung up. More than $600 million in gold was found there, making it the biggest gold strike on the planet. After two fires had completely leveled the town, the Imperial Hotel was built during the Reconstruction. Originally, it was called the Collins Hotel after the proprietor, Miss e. F. Collins, Mrs. E.F. Collins. In the first decade of operations, the hotel changed hands several times. Between 1905 and 1910, the hotel was renamed the Imperial Hotel and was and 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 uh, came under the ownership of an Englishman named George Long. As with all boom towns, murders and violence were common. The hotel flourished under George Long's ownership. He and his wife had two children, a daughter and then a son. They lived in the hotel. They had a little apartment there where they lived just off the main thing there. George's daughter suffered from a mental disability. She frequently went into fits and arguments ensued. She was routine, routinely locked into their apartment when she argued so as not to disturb the other guests. In the late 1930s, one argument sent her over the edge. She followed her father to the steps leading down to the coal bin and she bashed him in the head with an iron skillet. He tumbled down the rickety steps and was dead at the bottom. She was institutionalized for the crime. Well, a lot of places back then might have just executed her, but they knew she was mentally unwell, so I, I guess that's better than nothing. In 1946, Wayne and Dorothy Mackin bought the hotel from the widow Long. The Mackins produced turn-of-the-century melodramas on the hotel stage in an attempt to bring culture to Cripple Creek. This started a second boom in the town. Tourism. George Long is said to haunt the hotel. He's been seen several times. He frequents the downstairs bar. <laughs> George was known to like his scotch. So, you know. George was also deaf and he liked to paint. So, he was a, a he painted landscapes and things like that. He, he liked to paint his... Uh, native areas where he's from in England. As I understand it, his deafness made, he, he was born into a wealthy family, maybe arist aristocracy in England, but his his deafness was kind of a shameful for them, so they, they sent him to America, and it, it, he, has a, he has a history, I'm just saying. When gambling came to the town in 1992, George evidently became upset. Incidents of slamming doors, stuck drawers, and electronics going on the fritz skyrocketed. No explanation for any of these. They just happened, out of the blue. Other ghostly, unexplained events include slot machines dumping coins out when the hotel was closed, uh, knocking on doors, banging on walls, water faucets turning on by themselves, dresser drawers being removed and left on the floor so people would trip, doors opening by themselves, Rooms 39 and 42 are especially active. Now, the thing that <clears throat> the thing that gets you about the slot machine incidents, the it's at night, the casino's closed, the, you know, all the, there's no gamblers, there's nobody there, and the slot machine starts dumping coins out. There are fail safes to prevent that. Uh, when something happens, the machine goes haywire. There's a lock that that's supposed to prevent that from happening. All these fail safes just didn't work, and this thing started dumping coins out all over the floor. 
Um, so saying there's no explanation is like saying how it, it's not it's not well that's weird it's how the hell did that happen you know what i'm saying furthermore the entire town is a hot spot for spiritual activity many other buildings evidently have their own ghosts the ute indians the ones that are native to the area avoided the gulch they felt that evil spirits congregated there long before gold was discovered Add to all of that the fact that there's no way of knowing how many murders occurred in the town. You have a recipe for spiritual mayhem, spiritual encounters. The Imperial Hotel was closed, but the new owners are renovating it with plans to reopen. Um, if you're ever in Cripple Creek, Colorado, and you want to visit a truly haunted place, you do, you don't get much more haunted than Cripple Creek, and the main spot there would be the Imperial Casino Hotel, Penhurst Asylum. In 1903, Penhurst State School opened as Eastern Pennsylvania's state institution for the feeble-minded and epileptic. This was supposed to be a safe environment for the mentally challenged and epileptic to live and learn. Uh, yeah, not so much. Very soon, overcrowding, understaffing, and lack of funding caused the facility to fall into disrepair, and it caused poor living conditions. Uh, <clears throat> the residents were abused. They were, oh my God, abused. They were uh, mistreated on a horrific scale. As a matter of fact, in 1968... A documentary series titled Suffer the Little Children showed the horrors of the facility. Dr. Fear, that's in, yes, that's his real name, Fear. A doctor named Fear. F E A R, Fear. Anyway, that, that was his real name. He, This Dr. Fear admitted in the documentary to threatening and punishing patients. This son of a bitch admitted to injecting one patient with the most painful injection that would not cause damage. This guy liked inflicting pain, and he became a doctor at a mental institution. That's a recipe for disaster right there. If I'm checking a relative into, a, into any, any kind of a relative, into a facility, and the doctor is named Dr. Fear, we're leaving. I, don't, I, I, I mean, that's all I got to know. But on top of that, you find out his name really fit. I, I, I. The documentary showed that the money situation was really bad. Uh, each resident, the, 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 the facility spent $5.90, $5.90 on each resident. And that's in comparison to one of the, one of the zoos that spends $7.15 per day for each animal. So these people had less funding than the zoo had for their animals. The horrific conditions and vicious beatings compounded the inhumane treatment. In 1974, a class action lawsuit showed that the average age of the residents was 36 and that each resident spent an average of 21 years at Penhurst. Imagine spending 21 years in those conditions. Holy crap. One resident suffered about 40 injuries, including, get this, cracked teeth, a fractured finger, and a broken jaw. One former resident said that the facility reeked of feces, urine, and smelled like a doghouse. Ay, 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 ay. The Supreme Court issued a statement, quote, conditions at Pennhurst are not only dangerous with the residents often physically abused or drugged by staff members. Indeed, the court found that the physical, intellectual, and emotional skills of some residents have deteriorated at Pennhurst. Remember, this was supposed to be uh, a safe environment for the mentally challenged and epileptic to live and learn. And the Supreme Court said that they were actually deteriorating. That's not good. 
I don't care who you are. That's not good. Pennhurst was officially, finally, and mercifully shut down in 1987. Since then, literally hundreds of apparitions and paranormal events have been reported, especially in the underground tunnels and in the art room. Why any type of a, of a facility like that had underground tunnels is beyond me. Unless it's in a really cold area and you need a way to transport people between buildings that's warm. You know, maybe, I, I don't, I don't know. That's crazy. It, it doesn't seem viable to me, but that's, you know, it, it was the early, it was 19, 1903, so you never know. It seems that the most haunted places originate from the places where the living are treated the worst. And that, that makes sense. It, as I understand it, most hauntings are, are based in an emotional state. So, emotional trauma causes people, if, if, if there are such things as hauntings, causes these hauntings to happen in specific places. Essentially, man's inhumanity to man seems to create these places. And if that's the case, Pennhurst Asylum is a, a right candidate. If anybody else has any more information or knows anything else about this, please put it in the comments. I'm sure everybody would love to read it. I, I, the people who ran Pennhurst, especially that Dr. Fear, need to be in prison. That, that's all I'm saying. I know it's old and He's probably dead by now, but I hope he's as tortured as the people he did torture. Waverly Hills Sanatorium. The Waverly Hills Sanatorium was opened in 1910 in Louisville, Kentucky. It was essentially a tuberculosis hospital and held up to 500 patients. Um, tuberculosis, if you don't know, is also called the White Plague. It ran rampant around the turn of the century, around 1900. And especially in the warmer, wet climates of the area, Kentucky, for example. Um, here's here's the thing: uh, a lot of these patients, I think, were were mistreated, and that happens a lot in a lot of the the facilities back then. The medical profession isn't what it is today. At least back then, it wasn't what it is today. And sometimes tuberculosis could reach the brain. And when it did, those patients were treated with electroshock therapy. Now this, this shock, electroshock therapy did no good, but the doctors didn't know what else to do. It sounds a lot like they were experimenting on these patients to try to find a way to treat tuberculosis. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what it sounds like to me. Whenever I hear electroshock therapy, I cannot help but remember the videos that I did on MK Ultra. I don't, I, I, there, there may have been people that electroshock therapy helped, but I don't, I can't think of any instant where electroshock therapy was used and it had a positive outcome. I don't know. That's just me. If anybody else has any comments, put them in there. I'd be glad to read them. The sanatorium was very self-sufficient. It, it, they grew their own food. They raised their own livestock even had its own post office, so it was like its own little community there. Patients who came there rarely left. It was finally closed in 1961. Now, <clears throat> other than the electroshock therapy, I couldn't find any records of people actually being abused, but there's another disturbing thing about this place that bears mentioning. Okay, before I get to that, though, tens of thousands of people did die here over the decades. Nobody knows exactly how many because I think the records weren't really well kept. Here's, here's the, the, the weird part. The sanatorium, sanitarium had a body chute, so dead bodies wouldn't, weren't carried through the halls. I, I can see them doing that so, so as not to upset the other patients. But if you have a facility and the facility has a body chute, I'm thinking there's something wrong with your facility. I, I'm, I, I can't see that being good. I'm sorry. That's just weird. Waverly Hill Sanitarium is reputedly one of the most haunted places in the world. Literally hundreds of ghosts have been reported here, including a homeless man and his dog who supposedly fell down an elevator shaft well after the sanatorium closed down. Now, I find that weird. I can I can see a homeless guy. He's cold. He's maybe maybe drinking a little. He gets in there. He falls down the 
the elevator shaft. I can see that. But his dog as well? Dogs don't get drunk and dogs... I mean, unless the dog was so loyal it jumped in after him. Or maybe he had the dog by the leash or was holding the dog or whatever when he fell, maybe. That's just weird. I, I guess he could be holding the dog. That you know. At any rate... Apparently, a little boy's ghost named Timmy, a little boy named Timmy, his ghost is evidently there and likes to play with a blue rubber ball. You can, People have heard it bouncing and seen it bouncing along the hall. During its operating days, the sanatorium experienced two suicides, both in the same room. They were two nurses. I don't know the story of the one, but the, the, the other one, the, the, the one nurse, I know, as I understand it, she got pregnant and the doctor that impregnated her didn't want to take responsibility and back then that was a, a big deal and I don't know what happened with the other nurse but apparently they both nurses committed suicide in the same room one as I understand it one hung herself the other one jumped out the window um, regardless that room's got to have some bad energy let me tell you reportedly many photos and videos from all over the facility show full body apparitions orbs and objects moving on their own now if there's if there are such things as hauntings you know if ghosts are real this would be one of the places they would congregate I, I especially if you had electroshock therapy I can see you hanging out there but my point is you know with the, with the trauma uh, tuberculosis is a wasting disease and wasting away slowly like that I can see people dying and not realizing they died so they might not know that they're dead they're just hanging out there waiting Hibbing High School uh, before I get into this I want to tell you about a new book that I've got published just got published recently The House Off Farrago Road is now available on Amazon uh, the author's name is H.L. Anderson that's me it's just a fun story about a house where the denizens are not quite normal uh, excuse me, mythological creatures and supernatural forces co-mingle with modern-day law enforcement and the criminal underworld. If the quirky, weird piques your interest, check out The House Off Farrago Road. Now, on with this one. <clears throat> Hibbing High School. Uh, in northern Minnesota, about 80 miles northwest of Duluth on the Iron Range, sits an almost medieval-looking castle. This edifice does not look like a high school but it is the most opulent high school money could buy back in the 1920s. The crowning jewel in this palatial school is the auditorium. This auditorium was modeled after New York City's Capitol Theater. The woodwork, artwork, engravings, and crystal chandeliers will take your breath away. It is absolutely, I've seen pictures. It's absolutely gorgeous. Hibbing, Minnesota is a blue-collar mining town and has been for generations. By 1914, the economy in Hibbing was booming and was called the richest village in the world. They had iron mines. In 1920, the entire town moved. The entire town moved. The mining company, following the iron ore deposits, moved whole neighborhoods at the company's expense, as well as proposed the building of a grand high school. They had people showing up to work. These people had kids. Got to send the kids to school, right? So they proposed the building of a grand high school for these people. Initial construction began in 1920, and the, the cost in 1920 was $3.9 million. That's, that's unheard of. I mean, that would be, you may as well make it a billion dollars today. In 1922, a stage manager was brought in from New York to run that impressive auditorium. His name was Bill. Bill still has family who work at the school, so his last name is being withheld. Bill loved the theater, and he loved overseeing performances in this auditorium, and by all accounts, he was such a good person. There are multiple spirits who, have, uh, uh, who haunt the school, and they mostly seem to focus their attention on the auditorium. One spirit seems to be hanging around to enjoy the shows. He seems intent on occupying seat J47. J47. The current stage manager has gotten photos of that spirit. Stories of ghosts at the school include a person who fell off the balcony in the auditorium. Another story tells of a chandelier falling on the, on the seats below. 
Maybe that maybe it hit J47. Who knows? <clears throat> Still, another story tells of a disabled female student expiring in the auditorium. Um. Many believe Bill still works in the auditorium, his death in the 1940s notwithstanding. <laughs> he's, just, he's just still there doing his job, you know, he loved it so much. Uh, people have reported all manner of stuff. Items being moved with nobody in the area. People, having, people have uh, been seen walking into rooms when children were getting dressed and just disappearing. They walk in the room, the, the kid sees or, or hears them walk in, and the kid turns around and out there. Uh, and I'm, I say kid, these are high school students getting, you know, changing clothes for their productions on the stage. Um, I've seen, I, there, there are stories about kids who, who watch somebody walk into a room with no other exit, like a storeroom or whatever, and then they go in to find out who it is or to talk to them, and there's nobody there, that kind of thing. Uh, the janitors have reported all manner of strange occurrences from uh, noises, you know, whispers unseen voices, that kind of thing. Investigators have reported recording dozens of different voices with nobody present. They put a recorder out there and left. There was nobody there. They come back later, get it, and there's voices. Dozens of voices. Different voices. Phantom noises like footsteps, laughing, indis undiscernible voices, doors slamming, glass breaking, all kinds of different stuff. Cold spots are reported quite frequently. One teacher reported a wolf whistle, which echoed through the auditorium while she was on stage. And there was nobody else there. But, you know, she's on stage and somebody gives a wolf whistle kind of thing. Uh, can't do that these days. <laughs> Apparently the spirit is out of date. <laughs> if you do that these days, you get you slap with harassment. But the point being, all in all, people come from miles around to try to get a glimpse of one of these spirits in the school. And many of them do. Uh, you there's just all kinds of stuff going on there. If you get a chance to visit northern Minnesota, Hibbing High School, go check it out. Maybe you'll see one, too. Hotel Roosevelt. Uh, it's getting close on to, to Halloween, so I figured I'd give you a good one. Anyone who is a fan of classic Hollywood will recognize the names of the stars who stayed at this historic hotel. Uh, for parts of this video, I'm going to read excerpts from the book, Real Ghosts, Restless Spirits, and Haunted Places by the brilliant author and researcher Brad Steiger. I've talked about his book in other videos, and I maintain that it is an indispensable and incredible research tool for the serious paranormal enthusiast. You really got to get it. It's good. Um, the Hotel, Ro Hotel, Ro Hotel Roosevelt is in Hollywood, California, and a lot of the big stars stayed there back in the day. Uh... A lot of people think they're still there. Just saying. I'm going to read several paragraphs from this book, pages 416 through 419. Uh, <clears throat> we're talking about uh, Marilyn Monroe, Montgomery Clift, and Carol Lombard. Lombard shared her fabulous top floor suite with Clark Gable, and the elegant doctor is basically the way the ill-fated act... Yes, let me start that over. Carol Lombard shared her fabulous top floor suite with with a Clark Gable, and the elegant decor is basically the way the ill-fated actress left it. The essence of romantic Hollywood is nowhere more powerful than at this glamorous star's favorite hideaway. Numerous guests who have shared the romance of this suite have also experienced an encounter with the gorgeous ghost of the actress herself. Marilyn Monroe posed for her first print advertisement on the diving board of the Roosevelt's pool, and she stayed often at the hotel over the years, preferring a second-floor cabana room overlooking the pool. Her favorite mirror is on display in the lower elevator foyer, and numerous individuals have claimed to have seen Monroe's sensuous image near or superimposed over their own when they stopped to look in the reflecting glass. In December of 1990, while my wife Sherry Hansen Steiger and I were in the lower elevator foyer taping a Ghosts of Hollywood segment for a Japanese television program, a hotel guest, curious as to what we were filming, stopped to watch the proceedings. Suddenly, he stepped briskly aside as if to avoid a collision with some unseen person and stifled a cry of surprise which interrupted the scene that we were filming. 
When the director asked the man what was wrong, he replied, somewhat shaken, didn't you see that blonde woman who just brushed by me? If I didn't know Marilyn Monroe was dead, I would have sworn it was her. As we quizzed him about his experience, he appeared only mildly interested when we explained that the full-length mirror in the foyer had once been a personal favorite of Marilyn Monroe. But the woman who brushed by me was solid flesh and blood, he insisted. She was no ghost. The man talked off, uh, excuse me, the man stalked off a bit indignant, fixing us with an incredulous glare uh, when we, together with the director and the camera crew, tried to make him understand that there had been no woman visible to the rest of us in the foyer. Montgomery Clift lived at the hotel for three months during the final stages of filming From Here to Eternity. He A great movie if you haven't seen it, From Here to Eternity. He would often pace the hall outside of his ninth floor apartment, rehearsing his lines and sometimes practicing bugle calls, much to the consternation of nearby guests who were trying to get some sleep. Kelly Green, one of the personable staff members of the Roosevelt, told us of the dozens of guests who had heard Cliff's bugle blowing long after his death in 1966. It's it, the, the, the amount of of uh, history and the amount of uh, ghostly sightings in that hotel, it's it's mind-boggling. If you get the opportunity to stay at the Hotel Roosevelt, you need to do it. If, you, if you're a, any kind of an enthusiast of Hollywood or if you enjoy the paranormal, this, this is the place to go. Again, kudos to author Brad Steiger. I have found his book to be an unparalleled research tool. And God bless you, sir. You're awesome. As for the Roosevelt Hotel, as for the Roosevelt Hotel in Hollywood, California, if you have a yearning to go back in time and see a slice of Hollywood from its heyday, and you'd like a chance to see Carol Lombard, Marilyn Monroe, and or Montgomery Clift, book a room at the Roosevelt. Ask the front desk person which rooms are the most active and take a chance. Who knows? The worst will happen is you don't see anything, but you might see one or more of them. You never know. On the luxury liner, the Queen Mary. The historic ocean liner, the Queen Mary, is reportedly one of the top 10 haunted tours in the world. Now, <coughs> let's, uh, let's call a skunk a skunk. The fact that they, that they do haunted tours on this boat would be enough to make me question the validity of the reported hauntings because it would be like they're making money off of it. However, the reports of the strange and paranormal happenings on board stretch back long before the ocean liner was retired. The Queen Mary made her maiden voyage on May 27, 1936. She carried some 2.2 million passengers during peacetime and was converted to a troop ship during World War II, carrying over 800,000 military personnel during that conflict. She was painted gray during her wartime stint and was nicknamed the Gray Ghost. The Queen Mary was bigger and faster than the Titanic and was the epitome of luxury and splendor. <laughs> Soldiers who was on that trail on that boat, man, they, they traveled in style, let me tell you. A famous English psychic named Lady Mabel Fortescue Harrison. I hope I got her name right. Anyway, she predicted that, quote, the Queen Mary will know her greatest fame and popularity when she never sails another mile or carries another fair-paying passenger, close quote. And she was right. <clears throat> the Queen Mary retired in 1967 and became a floating hotel off Long Beach, California. Since her retirement, she has seen over 50 million visitors. There have been 55 reported deaths on the Queen Mary while she sailed the oceans. However, since records were not kept during World War II, it is likely, that number is likely much higher. At least 16 crew members died in, on, on the boat itself including in 1966 in, in 1966 J Petter P E D D E R Petter was crushed to death by a watertight door below decks in 1949 W E Stark accidentally drank acid which he thought was gin 
He reported it, but refused to go to the hospital. He kind of laughed it off. Then he died three days later. While not strictly on board, uh, death, yeah. there's some more deaths that were not strictly on board. I'm going to include them here because technically they were caused by the Queen Mary, but it was accidental. In 1942, the Queen Mary accidentally rammed and cut through her escort ship, the HMS Curacoa, killing over 300 people. The ships were zigzagging to avoid enemy submarines, and they just smashed right into her. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Over the years, many odd and strange sightings, experiences, and occurrences have been reported on the Queen Mary. Many apparitions have been reported. For example, the ghost of a young woman in her early 20s and dressed like a 60s Woodstock participant prowls the pool area. People have been grabbed, pushed, and pulled by unseen assailants. People hear old 40s-style music like Glenn Miller. People hear footsteps. They hear doorknobs rattle. They hear disembodied voices and screams. People smell the distinct odor of cigar and pipe smoke. That's very common. Doors open and close by themselves. Items get moved with no explanation. People report crewmen wearing vintage clothing warning them of storms and of enemy ships in the area. A worker on board suddenly found himself reliving the final voyage of the Queen Mary before her retirement. He experienced the despair and the depression <clears throat> of the various crew members who knew they were about to be laid off. One specific room Cabin B340 was closed for 30 years. It is reportedly the most haunted room on the ship. A man of an unknown identity was found dead inside the room with an unknown cause of death. So they didn't know who he was and they didn't know how he died, but he, they found him in the room. That's crazy. Multiple apparitions have been seen inside that room. Housekeepers report that water in the sink and the lights have been turned on or off by unseen hands. So water in the sink turns on and off by itself and the lights turn on and off by themselves. <clears throat> and it's not like there's a short because the light switch gets flipped, you know? And you can't turn the water on and off in the sink without turning the knobs. You see what I'm saying? In multiple instances, bed sheets and covers have been pulled off the bed. <clears throat> Housekeepers have reported that. Now, B340 has recently been renovated and has been open to the public, and you can stay in that room, if you dare. Uh, all in all, given the history of the vessel, the Queen Mary may very well be the most haunted ocean liner in existence. And again, it's off Long Beach, California, and you can rent a room. <laughs> Good luck with that. I don't know that I'm heading there. Harl Pruitt. Um... I, I, I didn't know anything about this story until I read an article the other day. And then I found another a, a video online that had a lot of good information. And I did some research in some other places. And I found a lot of good information on this. So I'm going to go ahead and do it. It is rare that you ever hear of a ghost or any kind of non-demonic non entity that actually physically hurts people. Demonic activity, you know, you know, yeah. And there are some non-human entities that are not demonic and they sometimes hurt people. But this is just a ghost. A, 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 a damaged soul, so to speak. <clears throat> and then, and then the, this is the case of Carl Pruitt. That he's the damaged soul. Carl Pruitt worked as a carpenter in a small town in rural Kentucky. And again... I'm piecing this together from several articles. The towns were all different, so the information is the same, but it's just the names are different, which happens sometimes in folklore. So, But the information, again, is all the same. Um, he worked as a carpenter in a small town in rural, in rural Kentucky. In June of 1938, Pruitt returned home to discover his wife with another man. The other man fled, and in a fit of rage, Carl strangled his wife to death with a length of chain. Then, out of guilt and remorse, Carl, Carl Pruitt committed suicide. So it's a, it's a tragic end all the way around. 
His wife's family would not allow him to be buried next to his wife, who was the love of his life. Instead, he was buried in a cemetery at a, at a, in a nearby town. He was buried alone and in disgrace. It's just, it, I mean, that's just a sad ending. It's crazy. This guy was a, he was a, by all accounts, he was a good man. He worked as a carpenter. I couldn't find anything about him being, you know, a real son of a bitch or whatever. He, he, by all accounts, he was a good guy. But stuff happens and he ended up being buried alone and in disgrace in another town. That, that, that would be, I'm sorry, that would be a slap in the face to me. But <clears throat> one day, a visitor to the cemetery noticed peculiar circular shadows on the surface of Carl's gravestone. They looked eerily. They looked eerily like a chain. Then the unexplained deaths began. Shortly thereafter, a child named James Collins mischievously threw rocks at the tombstone. Then on the way home, he, you're gonna get the, you're gonna love this. He fell off of his bicycle, and somehow was strangled to death by the bike's chain. Now I've caught my leg in a chain. I've, uh, you know, the the chain has caught my my pants leg or whatever and pulled it back i've got my my toe caught in a chain one time it was very very painful i don't know how you could get your neck caught in the, in the chain that to me there that's that right there tells you there's something to this story that's all i'm saying james's mother and, and the kid died you know from this james's mother in a fit of anger over her dead son took an axe and destroyed the gravestone. Later, she was found at home. She had somehow become tangled in her clothesline and strangled to death. Still can't explain that, you know. A few days later, the gravestone was back over Carl's grave, fully intact despite having been destroyed by Mrs. Collins. Several years later, a farmer fired several pistol rounds at the gravestone. He was later found strangled by the reins of his horse. Uh, excuse me. Let me, read, let me read that one again. Sorry, I can't read my own writing. He was later found strangled by the reins of his own horse-drawn carriage. Yeah, so he's, he's driving his horse in the carriage, and he somehow gets strangled by the reins. Yeah. Um, similar deaths occurred every few years or so culminating in the fatality of a local policeman. This cop had hurled insulting jokes and remarks at the gravestone about the ghost and the curse. Then he took photographs of the gravesite. On the drive home from the cemetery, he crashed his car into a fence. One of the links of chain from the fence decapitated him. Yeah. Well, in the 1950s, the cemetery and bodies were moved. Um, I believe a strip mining company came in and the ghostly killings stopped. One or two such deaths with direct links to Pruitt's grave might be considered a coincidence, <clears throat> but the deaths continued for two decades. That's a bit much for anyone to swallow. I could not find where Carl uh, Pruitt's remains were laid to rest, but wherever they ended up, I guess he was satisfied because, like I said, the murder stopped, the death stopped. I'm sure we all pray that he rests in peace to keep that stuff from happening again. That's the first time I ever had a vengeful ghost go after somebody in one of my, that, at least that I'm aware of. That, that, that story was just too crazy not to relate. The Kasha House of Kaimuki. Kaimuki. It's, it's Hawaiian. And my pronunciation is atrocious, and I apologize. This they deserve better for the because the, I I just I don't know how to pronounce it. K a i m u k i kai kai muki kai muki. Anyway, when one thinks of the supernatural, it's a rare few who think of Hawaii. I was amazed to find the stories of the night marchers. Check out my video on that phenomena. Then I found this story, <clears throat> and I was just as amazed. In reading this story, I found it very similar to other stories I've done where evil entities attack the living. For those of you who don't know what a kasha is, I got the definition here. Hang on. Let me read this. In ancient Japan, the literal translation translation of the name kasha is a fire cart. It is a creature 
that frequent, frequented populated areas where its dietary sustenance consisted of fresh human corpses. According to the lore, these creatures are a type of Bake Nico living among human beings under the guise of a common house cat or stray. They are bipedal and larger than most people, and they are accompanied by flames from hell, where they make their advent in the evening during rainy or stormy weather. It is only during funerals that their true forms are revealed, and as a result, they are known to snatch corpses and spirit them to hell for punishment. Akasha will animate a corpse as a puppet or simply eat it as a meal. More often than not, the Kasha is known to indulge in the latter, meaning it's more than likely it's going to eat the, the corpse, which is kind of fucking freaky. Sorry. All right, <clears throat> so that's Akasha. On August 13th, 1942, at 1.25 a.m., Police Sergeant Mosley Cummins, C-U-M-M-I-N-S, Cummins, and Patrolman Robert Anseth responded to a call. They found a 10-year-old boy and his two sisters, 18 and 20, on their living room sofa. They were screeching in fear. Their mother, also shrieking, <clears throat> was waving tea leaves and sprinkling salt to ward off ghosts. The mother stated that at 10 p.m., the boy smelled a ghost, which I don't understand that part, but that's what it said. Uh, the boy smelled a ghost in the home. Evidently, the ghosts were very angry at being discovered. They attacked the boy and then his two sisters, tried to strangle them. The mother blamed her husband, who had previously left her. So I, I, don't, know, I don't know how that figured in, but it was there, so I figured I'd let you know. Apparently, the husband had something to do with it. I don't know. Um, the two police battled the ghosts for over an hour before evacuating. They retreated and took the four civilians to a relative's house for safety at around 3 a.m. That, that um, And this is in the police report. It's documented the police battled ghosts. Now, we're, we're going to skip ahead 30 years. On October 31st, Halloween of 1972, the police got a call from three teenage girls who were staying in that same house. They'd heard footsteps and strange voices, and then one of the girls felt someone touch her arm. <coughs> the girls requested the police to follow them to another house. Excuse me. And on the way, the girls pulled over. The police pulled over. When the officers approached, the girl in the middle of the front seat was fighting an unseen assailant who was trying to strangle her. All three girls apparently were in the front seat. Can't do that now because you got to have those seatbelt laws. But back then, in 72, you know, all three, I remember that, people riding in the front seat like that. One of the officers reached in to help because the girl was being strangled in the middle. One of the officers reached in to help and his arm was grabbed by a big, strong, calloused hand that, quote, wasn't there. It twisted his arm. He ran back to his car and radioed for backup. The other officer put the girl in their car and told the other girls to follow them in their car. The, the squad car wouldn't start. So they put the girl back into their car and then the squad car started up. Yeah. The, so they drove a short way. They were following the, the girls again. They drove a short way before the same girl fell out onto the road. The two officers ran to her. She was tearing at her throat as if someone was choking her. The two officers together could not pull her hands away. The sergeant, a Hawaiian officer, ran into a nearby cafe and returned with salt and a glass of water, which he sprayed on everyone. The situation immediately calmed down. The entity in these two stories is eerily reminiscent of the entities discussed in the San Pedro haunting, the Harrisville haunting, uh, the Doris Bither haunting, and others. Be sure to check out my my videos on those famous accounts. But here's my here's my 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 
take on this. You have two sets of police officers. They were called to the same house three decades apart. Both sets of officers witnessed and actually fought attacking entities which they could not see but were trying to strangle people. Police reports and newspaper articles exist which corroborate all of this. It verifies the, that the accounts are true. That is a lot more evidence than most ghost stories enjoy. Um, I, I read this account and <clears throat> I, 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 I couldn't believe it. I had to reread the article. It's one thing to say, well, we witnessed this, we saw that. We got this on video, of the, 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 you know, a uh, door opening or something moving across the floor. Yeah, that's all cool. When you have police putting it in their police reports. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, that shit ain't right. <laughs> Grand old lady, the USS Hornet. Okay, anyone who doesn't know the history of the USS Hornet is really, really missing out. The Hornet is one of the most famous aircraft carriers in world history. She is currently the Sea, Air, and Space Museum in San Francisco Bay at Alameda. It is possible to visit the ship and go aboard on a tour. I highly recommend you do so. Even if you're not a ghost enthusiast, this is a historic ship, and they're working to restore her to, to her original shape. And walking through her through her halls and on her decks is living in history. <clears throat> the USS Hornet was built in 1942-1943 and fought in every major engagement on the front lines of World War II until June 1945, when she was taken out of the war by a typhoon. She survived countless engagements with the Japanese and she later fought in the Korean conflict. Her air group set Navy records that will never, ever be broken. In July of 1969, she recovered the Apollo astronauts when they returned from the moon. This lady is literally a living legend. We should treat her with all the respect that she deserves. She is currently being restored to her original condition there in Alameda, off out, you know, in San Francisco Bay. And again, visit her walk on the decks, you're, you're going to enjoy yourself. That's all there is to it. Visitors and workers on Hornet had, have had hundreds of paranormal experiences, including shadows moving down the, the halls and through doors and hatchways, unexplained disembodied voices, people have reported being touched. The crew that use mag lights where the item must be twisted to activate and flashlights Excuse me, these flashlights have been filmed activating on their own. So it's not just a button, you have to twist the thing in order to turn it on, and then they come on on their own. Investigators have gotten dozens of EVPs. If you don't know what that is, it's called it's an, an electronic voice phenomena. And they've gotten videos of shadows as well. I've done videos on EVPs, go check that out. Um when when you visit this this ship be sure and visit the hot spots. The hot spots include uh, the hot spots on board this ship include the sick bay, which makes sense because you know that's where the dying people are brought there. The, and the ship's in battle; people get hurt. Where do they go? They go to sick bay. I'm going to say not all of them survived. I'm just saying it is war; people die. The other hot one of the other hot spots is the admiral's bedroom. That's an important thing. Now. <clears throat> One of the, spe the speculations of the workers at the Sea, Air, and Space Museum is that the spirits infesting the Hornet are former crewmen still loyal to their beloved carrier who are trying to continue their tasks aboard ship. They're trying to continue the mission. Some have theorized that they don't know that the vessel is no longer at war. Who knows? Regardless, I'd like to take this opportunity to express my deepest respect for all the souls who served aboard Hornet, God bless you all. Um, it is doubtful that World War One, uh, World War Two, rather, would have ended the same way without this ship. So, if and or when you do visit this ship, thank her for your freedoms, because 
she is directly responsible for you still having them. Alien ghosts. Yeah. Um. Yeah, this, this I, I've been trying to figure out a way to do this. And no matter how I figure it, to me, there's always a better way to do it. So I'm just going to buckle down and do it. That's all I can do. The late great author Jim Mars wrote and spoke about reports of military personnel encountering the spectral images of the little aliens who died at the hospital at Roswell Military Airfield after the 1947 UFO crash. He had documented evidence including affidavits from witnesses and accounts from people who had been told about the encounters from other first-hand witnesses. The only thing that would have been more convincing would have been photos and videos of the alien apparitions. I did not see those. I don't know if he's got them or not, but there you go. Uh, there's a book that I tout a lot because it's really, really good. The book is Real Ghosts, Restless Spirits, and Haunted Places. The, the author is Brad Steiger. He dedicated an entire chapter to this topic of alien ghosts. A farm family from Iowa was terrorized by, by what they thought was men in black after a UFO sighting. Several times, these beings disappeared with no explanation, once from an aircraft in flight. Now, that's a broadly paraphrased, very shortened, you know, account of the situation. you got to read the book. It's really good. Uh, a Protestant minister was tormented by strange shape-shifting entities for over 25 years. A foul odor followed them around and strange events plagued them. All of this after a UFO sighting. His wife divorced him. Uh, after 10 years of this, three beings showed up and allowed him to photograph them as they changed shapes. Then, three police officers showed up. They claimed to be UFO buffs and wanted to see his photographs. They offered to use their credentials to prove to the world that he was sane and that UFOs and paranormal phenomena were real. The next night, these same police officers confiscated his photos and kidnapped him. They loudly debated killing him for a while while they were driving around, but, but then they released him into a wooded area. There's a section in there on fallen angels who serve evil. These, what are they called? Aramanes, A-H-R-I-M-A-N-E-S, I guess, seem to travel on ethereal UFOs. Their goal is the enslavement of mankind. Now, this, this didn't deal directly, in my opinion, this particular section didn't deal directly with the ghosts, but the book... He kind of, I guess he had all these reports that didn't quite fit anywhere else. He kind of lumped them together. But to me, this is either religious or mythological or something. But it kind of sort of fits in with the ghost motif. So there you go. If aliens are real, then perhaps they have souls. If they have souls, then perhaps those souls survive the death of their mortal host. If that is true, then what happens to them? Where do they go? Is there an alien heaven? If so, is there an alien hell? Could it be that sometimes these travelers far from home get lost on their way? I mean, if they're, if human beings get lost after they die and they can't quite get into the light there, the people, you know, they wander around and stuff, and that's the, the idea behind ghosts. Perhaps the aliens are the same way. Who knows? We may have more in common with these aliens than, than we know. Ghostly warnings. I could have probably labeled this under unexplained phenomena, but it had more of a ghost feel to it. So, here we go. Historic haunting. History is rife with stories of phantoms or dead relatives warning the living about impending disasters. During World War II, a man was asleep in his bunk on board a freighter in the Atlantic. The ghost of his mother warned him that it was time to get up. After that, he, of course, couldn't couldn't go back to sleep, so he got dressed and went down to the engine room. Just then, an enemy torpedo struck the ship. He'd been, had he been asleep, he might not have survived. Uh, another story. A woman was awakened from a sound sleep by the voice of her dead husband yelling, Fire. She, was discover she, she discovered that her house was indeed on fire and was able to call 911 and save the cabin. 
Uh, another story, a group of children in a new house. They were walking down into the basement. They all saw the, that their dead mother at the bottom of the stairs, waving them to go back up the stairs. Turns out there was an old cistern at the bottom of the stairs with a rotted wood cover. The landlord said he needed to fix it before anyone went down into the basement. They could have fallen to their death. But their mother warned them not to go down the stairs. They all saw it. It wasn't one person. It was all of them saw it. Now I want to credit the book Real Ghosts, Restless Spirits, and Haunted Places by Brad Steiger for this, the, these three stories. They're all in there. I used his book for research for this video. He is an excellent researcher and a writer, and his book is outstanding. I highly recommend it. These are only three of the thousands of reports throughout history of such ghostly warnings. These warnings have saved untold thousands of people from a variety of dangers, enemy attacks, you know, from enemy attacks to fires to dangerous animals and people to physical dangers from inanimate objects. Just you name it, it's there. Apparently, dead relatives are wanting people to stay alive, and that's a good thing. You know what I'm saying? Now, if this happened once or twice, I, I could see people dismissing this as the ravings of lunatics or kooks or maybe even hoaxes. The sheer number of these reports from all over the world by people who have never met and have no reason to lie force us to sit up and take notice. There is something to this. The realm of the unknown is far greater than the realm of the known. And in my humble opinion, the love of the dearly departed far surpasses death. After all, if you had the opportunity and the means to warn your kid of danger, would you let a little thing like death stop you? I wouldn't. <laughs> I mean, honestly, there's 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 people, and, and you hear it all through history. All It's in popular culture, television, it's in movies. The dead relatives, spirits, restless spirits warning people of danger. I actually remember vaguely I can't quote you the story it was something about a, an engineer on a train and he's driving the train and it's at night and he sees somebody waving a lantern and of course he's new on the route so he sees somebody waving the lantern and it's, he's supposed to get him to stop so he hits the brakes and stops and then of course the guys whoever was waving the lantern is gone and he, you know, he's trying to figure out what's going on when a a, a vehicle drives up and it's tra it's a track train track workers uh you know railroad workers they come up and they say something to the effect of yeah the bridge is washed out you'll have to back up and take this other route if that person hadn't been there that that spirit hadn't been there with the with the uh lantern the glowing lantern he would have kept going and the whole train would have went right off into the ravine so these things are real I've I've heard of uh, stories of people driving on the highway. I did a, a a video about highway phantoms. I heard a story about a guy driving a truck, a big rig, and there was a go. He, he saw somebody by the side of the road, and he pulled over to pick him up, and they got it got up into the into the cabin, up into the into the 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 cab with him, and it was a it was a young guy. And he said, uh, you're going to have to turn around and go back because the bridge up here is out. And he goes, oh, really? Thanks for telling me. So he turns around and he, he he's heading down and he looks over and the guy's gone. It's crazy. These stories are everywhere. And, and there's so many of them. You cannot, you cannot ignore them. There absolutely has to be something to this. That's all I'm saying. The Hollymont House. There exists a house in Beechwood Canyon, California, named the Hollymont House. It was built in the 1920s, and for all intents and purposes, it looks like any other house in the neighborhood. Official records show nothing unusual in the, in the house's past, yet every occupant of that house has reported strange happenings since the 1950s. Uh, these happenings include cold spots, Sp uh, fires starting spontaneously, the smell of rotting meat, and the smell of perfume. The apparition of a beautiful young woman has been reported numerous times. They theorize that the perfume smell might be from her. But we don't know. So little is known about this. We, we, 
normally when you research a haunted, you know, any kind of a, of a, of a house, a structure, an area, there's official records that go back, you know, decades, centuries even, and you could figure out what you you can figure out what uh, what traumas may have affected the area, you know, what bad things happened in the house, what bad things, you know, what wars were fought there, whatever, a bad, oh, a civil war battle was fought there, that kind of thing, you know, something traumatic. But with this house, there's nothing. They can't find a damn thing. But the 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 events, the the paranormal happenings, were getting to be annoying. So they called in a priest to bless the house. In full view of several witnesses, the priest's hat disappeared off of his head. <clears throat> Later, the hat was found up on the roof. That says there's definitely something there. It's not a hoax. You have multiple witnesses seeing it. You know, there's 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 more to it than just it's not bullshit. Okay, it's not a hoax. None of these events had any reasonable explanation until an investigative team found a tunnel underground that connected Hollymont House to the one of the neighbors' houses. So this is a, they found an underground tunnel that connected them. In that tunnel was a gravestone dated 1922. The name on the gravestone was a female name. Was this final resting place? Was this the final resting place of the beautiful young woman whose apparition was seen so many times? Who knows? The gravestone is the first bit of quote unquote abnormal ever discovered about Hollymont other than the, the paranormal happenings. If somebody was buried under there, that would explain a lot, you know. Many ghost stories and haunted house investigations end up having explanations for all of the paranormal occurrences, you know, you know, restless spirits, demonic activity, and even hoaxes. Hollymont has none of these. All we know is there's a gravestone in a tunnel under the house. The only thing Hollymont has is the lonely, forgotten gravestone in an underground tunnel. We we may never we, we may never know more than that, but that right there would explain a lot. Um, I, I don't know how much research has been done into whose grave that might be. I would, if if I were investigating that house, I would. Talk to the authorities and see about excavating in that tunnel. If there's a body under there, find out who the body belonged to. You know who who's actually buried there. That by itself would explain probably explain a lot. It might shed some light on the situation if nothing else. New Mexico State Prison. Uh, this place has been rife with stories of apparitions and different things for decades and I'm going to go into the reasons why. <clears throat> Before we get started on this video, however, I need for everyone to know that this particular story has a certain significance for me. My brother Robert was incarcerated at this prison when the 1980 riot occurred. Thankfully, he and another inmate broke out a window and fled the prison at the outbreak. They found the cops and gave themselves up. They were spared the horror of that event. Others were not so fortunate. <clears throat> okay. Here we go. <coughs> Excuse me. The New Mexico State Penitentiary near Santa Fe was built in 1956. It, it was built to house something like 900 inmates. By 1978, it housed over 1,200 inmates were housed in open bay type dormitories with very little privacy inmates uh, inmates slept on the floor when the beds were all taken many inmates felt they were treated like animals there was a snitch system in place I'm there the, the story is much bigger than this but I'm trying to condense it for the sake of, a, of, a, of the time of the video my target time is four minutes and I go over it way too much but 
there's a lot of information and I'm kind of condensing it. And I apologize. <clears throat> the nobody, none of the inmates were getting the mental care, psych psychiatric care that they needed, and it was it it was it was not a good situation. There was overcrowding. The the inmates had all kinds of mental issues that weren't being addressed, and there was in it, because they were so short on guards. There was a snitch system in place. Long story short, <clears throat> in February of 1980, inmates jumped three guards during the night count and, inv and instigated the most violent, brutal, and horrific prison riot in American history. 34 inmates died, and most of those were tortured to death. One inmate's head was paraded on a stick, Execution squads were out to settle scores, and enemies with enemies and snitches. Uh, there was work being done at the prison at the time, so so prisoners gained access to acetylene torches and other tools, and it was they were able to cut their way into cells, and they used these implements, various implements, including the torch on enemies that they wanted to get even with, snitches, that kind of thing. It was, the whole thing was horrific. It was brutal. And the cops, the state cops had surrounded the prison so nobody could escape, but they didn't get word to go in for quite some time, several days. Normally, I would not use a paranormal investigation television program in these videos, but in this case, their findings help to explain what happened. The Dead Files did an investigation at this prison, and I've done, uh, I did a video on paranormal, uh, paranormal uh, programs that my wife and I enjoy, and the Dead Files was listed as one of them because they're very compelling. Their investigation makes sense to me. Now, of course, it all could be fake. We don't know. But their investigation to me, their, their, investi their investigation style, the way that they go about their investigations, the, the bedrock reality of the research, to me, it, it strikes a chord. It makes more sense than a lot of the others. The Dead Files did this investigation at the prison, and in part... They found that for centuries the land that the prison was built on was fought over by local native tribes, Spanish conquistadors, Mexican explorers, and white Europeans. <clears throat> the land was cursed with evil long before the prison was built. Um, before the before long before the the Americas long before America became America there were stories about this land, this particular area being home to all manner of demons and evil spirits and things like that and it makes sense demonic and other evil presences inhabit this area the prison was built and you had basically you had crazy people not getting the mental help that they needed then the overcrowding compounded the problems when the kettle blew, literally all hell broke loose. Um, if if the, the demonic presences and the evil spirits, is the, the claims there, if they're valid, then this prison would have been an ideal breeding ground for their machinations. You see what I'm saying? The, 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 the land is cursed. There's evil presences and demonic spirits there. They build a prison, fill it with a bunch of crazy people, and don't give them the mental help they need. And at, with a snitch system in place, they, they encourage these crazy people to turn on each other. It was literally a recipe for disaster. And as I said, when the kettle blew, all hell broke loose. Over the years <clears throat> since this riot, dark figures, disembodied voices, apparitions, ghostly sounds, all manner 
of paranormal activity has been reported and it's been reported constantly from the ruins of this old prison. They built a new prison, but the old prison is still there and they, they man it with some, you know, a few people here and there, caretakers for lack of a better word. One thing I learned from the Dead Foul show is that new guards are warned to be aware and beware of the paranormal activity in the prison. It's in their handbook. So, <laughs> this is this is something you don't see a lot in, in paranormal videos. The state of New Mexico warns their corrections officers about the ghostly activity in this place. That tells you something. That is freaky. Can you imagine being hired on as a guard? You've got to be tough and bedrock. And right there in your handbook it says, <laughs> Watch out though because there's ghosts. Holy shit! That would that would just tear. Uh, that it's time to find a new damn job. That's all I'm saying. Ay yeah 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 yeah. And prayers for the people who survived this. Prayers for the the families of the people who, who were murdered in this. Uh, by all accounts, it was hell on earth, and nobody deserves to go through that. Ghosts of Flight 401. This, is, uh, this was the title of a movie back in the day. I found out the movie was based in reality. On December 29th, 1972, at 11.40 p.m. roughly, Eastern Airlines Flight 401 crashed into the Florida Everglades. The crash was caused primarily by human error, officially. But the truth is that a series of stupid little events all culminated in the airliner descending slowly and unnoticed in the dark until it was too late. The airplane was descending slowly and it was dark outside, so the pilot, nobody, excuse me, nobody on board noticed until it was too late. Flight 401 was a Lockheed Model L-1011 out of JFK Airport in New York. The crash claimed 101 lives and left 75 survivors. The crew was exceptionally experienced, thousands and thousands of flight hours. The pilot was Robert Bob Loft. The co-pilot or first officer was Albert Stockstill. The second officer was Don Repo. <clears throat> the engineer on board who was, he wasn't, uh, he wasn't actually officially part of the crew. He was just catching a ride. His name was Angelo Donato. Eventually, excuse me, evidently, a landing, I can't read my own writing. Evidently, a landing gear indicator was burnt out. The, the light bulb was burned. And they could not verify the nose gear was down and locked. It is believed that someone bumped a steering stick just enough to turn off the autopilot. But they didn't notice. And it was very, very dark outside. And the altitude warning alarm was very soft. One little ping, I think. So nobody heard it while they were you know, working on the gear light. <clears throat> By the time they realized they were descending, it was way, way too late. When, after the crash, locals helped the survivors. Um, some men in, a, in an airboat, one of those big fan boats in the Everglades. They, they were out frog catching frogs and stuff, so they were, they were helping the survivors. Bob Loft survived the crash, but then died before he could be extricated from the wreckage. So they were talking to him before he died. <clears throat> they just couldn't get him out of the plane in time to save him. Stockstill died on impact. Repo and Donatio, D Donatio were airlifted to hospital. Repo died later on. Donatio made a full recovery. Um, that was tragic. That was a ridiculous, tragic crash that should have never happened. Now, that being said, in various Eastern Airline L-1011 planes, the sightings began soon after. The occult presence was felt by different flight attendants in the galley. A white misty ball which morphed into a, a face with glasses was seen in the, in the galley. A flight attendant noted an extra passenger dressed in an Eastern Airlines captain's uniform. The captain seemed catatonic when asked questions. The captain was recognized as Bob Loft before he just disappeared right in front of everyone. <clears throat> These sightings occurred many times on many various different aircraft. 
it was all the the Eastern Airlines L-1011s, but it was different aircraft. One first-class passenger became hysterical when an Eastern Airlines officer sitting next to her disappeared. He was sitting there, she, she said something to him, and he just disappeared right in front of her. She, went, she was hysterical. And this was in first class. Many sightings reported Don Repo warning of problems with the planes. Several times male voices gave announcements over the PA systems. Uh, at one point, Don Repo told one flight engineer that there would never be another crash of an L-1011. <clears throat> at one point, a mechanic was handed a wrench by an unseen hand. There was nobody with him and somebody handed him a wrench. It was crazy. As it turns out, parts from the crashed Flight 401 were used on other Eastern Airlines L-1011s. And this is pr pretty regularly done. The parts were non-structural. Uh, non they were in good working order. They, they, they worked fine. The, there, there was no issue with the parts themselves. Um, and this is a common thing. When, when you have parts that are used in different, you know, you have spare parts, you use them in the planes. You know, it saves the company money. This is a fairly common practice. Once the parts were pulled from the planes, the sightings ended. Now, <clears throat> the reason that the parts were pulled from the planes is because the sheer number of sightings and reports was staggering. Eastern Airlines tried to downplay the sightings and even going so far as to cover it up by hiding reports in the, the logbook reports, the logbooks themselves. But the sheer number of, of sightings was ridiculous. The people who reported these sightings were very, very credible. None of them were insane, and none of them made money off of their stories. This is one of the most credible haunting accounts in history. It's very well known. Um, when, when you, and a lot of the people who witnessed the ghosts, witnessed these spirits or hauntings or whatever, recognized the crewmen because they had worked with them. Okay, so it's it's hard it's hard to say. Well, that didn't happen. You know what I'm saying? This is very very credible. It's a very credible situation. So the next time you're uh, seated on an airplane and, and there's a an an airline officer sitting next to you, you might want to be wary. Just saying. I've done videos on paranormal events and demonic activity. Go and check those out. In those, I talk about, in some of those, I talk about the Amityville house, where at the very least, strange events occur. Uh, there's a lot of people who think that it was all a hoax. And it may have been, I don't know. But, there is one event that cannot, cannot, cannot be disputed. Somebody went room to room, killing six people, with a rifle, a thirty-five caliber... A 35 caliber Marlin rifle. That gun is loud. Anybody who argues that doesn't know guns. That is a loud freaking rifle. I have heard previous stories where it was a 308. I heard one excerpt where it was a shotgun. From the official report, it was a 35 caliber Marlin. So I'm trying. I'm trying to get that right. I think I got it wrong in some other videos. But it, regardless. A rifle is loud. Anybody who disputes that is is they don't know guns. They've never been to the range. Here's the thing: this guy went room to room with a 35 caliber Marlin rifle, and nobody bothered to wake up. Nobody bothered to say "Holy crap!" and jump out a window. Furthermore, no neighbors heard anything about it. Okay, that event did occur. The neighbors had no idea. They, they didn't hear any gunfire. It was it was early in the morning. None of the victims were on drugs or any sedatives or anything like that. Nobody woke up and tried to escape. That's ridiculous. Um, let me get into the crux of this. That's the event that did, in fact, happen that makes me think there was something paranormal here. That doesn't make sense to me. Here we go. <clears throat> the house at 112 Ocean Avenue in Amityville, New York, was built in 1925. The house has had a rich history of paranormal events since 1974. Now, the event that happened in 1974 was Ronald DeFeo Jr. shot and killed six member of his, members of his family in the house. That's the event I was telling you about. 
He was sentenced to six year, uh, six 25-year terms and died in custody in 2021. This man went room to room with a rifle shooting people and nobody bothered to wake up. There were no, na no neighbors heard any gunshots and there were nobody was on drugs or any sedatives or anything like that. So that's out the window. Something happened to keep these people asleep. Okay, now... Uh, if you go looking for the house, I believe they've changed the address because of tourism and, and people were showing up and, you know, trying to get in to see the place and what all. So they may have changed the address. I'm not sure what it is. They may have changed it twice. At any rate, after this happened, this event with the, with the guy shooting everybody, later on, another family named Lutz bought the house but fled the premises after only 28 days leaving all of their possessions they never ever went back this is this was the impetus for uh, a book called the amityville horror and it, it's a number of tv movies and tv series and uh no what is it uh, motion pictures based on this so it's 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 a big deal it's well known a lot of people say it's a hoax i don't know i honestly don't know the paranormal activity during the Lutz occupancy was well documented. A friend of the family insisted they have the house blessed. From the first flick of holy water, he heard a masculine voice demand, get out. I'm sorry, <clears throat> if I'm standing there going to say a prayer and a masculine voice out of nowhere says, get out, I'm leaving. It's time to get the hell out of Dodge. That's just me. Call me weird. I, I'm I, for those of you who don't know I'm a gun guy I like guns I'm armed to the teeth what the hell is my gun gonna do to that it's time to go um, he, this priest did not tell the Lutzes but phoned later to warn them to stay out of the second story room where he'd heard the voice the call was cut short by static so he never actually got to deliver that warning the priest later developed a high fever and blisters on his hands. I, I've heard that it was something like stigmata, but I, I'm, you know, I'm not going to get into that. Uh, I don't know Catholic religion that well. I'm not going to claim to. I'm not going to disrespect anybody by trying to explain it because I don't know. You guys can look that up on your own. Talk to talk to somebody who does know. Um, George Lutz began undergoing some kind of psychological or psychic assault. His moods and manner changed, becoming more and more extreme. He had to keep a fire going because he was constantly cold. Uh, he was hearing voices. He, he, he woke up at odd hours of the night. It was just, it was weird. Uh, a plethora of various events plagued the family, including an imaginary friend of one of the children that seemed to be demonic in nature and demonic animals started making themselves known. They saw a pig with red glowing eyes and all kinds of stuff. George and Kathleen Lutz took polygraph tests and passed. So this, this if, if they were faking it, they, they're good at it. I'm just saying. There's a, a, a pair of world famous, I guess you call them paranormal inv investigators, demonologists, whatever. Their, their names are Ed and Lorraine Warren. They're very, very famous. They investigated this house. One of the film crew that was with them got a picture of a demonic boy looking out of a doorway at the foot of the stairs. Uh, I talked about this in another video. They're, they're taking pictures, blah, 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 blah. And on the way out, one of the pictures shows up and there's a kid looking out and he's got red glowing eyes. So, that I saw that picture. That's real. Many people feel that this was a hoax to sell books and make movies for profit. Regardless uh, of, of any of that, how does a man kill six people who were not drugged and none of them bother to wake up, nor do any neighbors hear the shots? That right there, to me, screams paranormal. And there have been another number of people who tried to go and investigate that house for, for whatever reason. I don't think it's ever, since the Warrens left, I don't think it's ever had a really thorough paranormal investigation. I would like to see a good group go in and do it. Doris Bither. If, uh, if there was one group of cases that would show irrefutable evidence of paranormal activity, then that group would literally have to include the case of Doris Bither. 
By the way, I did a video on paranormal assaults. Be sure to check it out in that video. I mispronounced her name. I, I said it was Bither, and it's not. It's pronounced Bither. Apologies there. Um, her story was the inspiration for the novel and movie, The Entity. Okay? They changed her name in the movie, and they... In the movie, she was played by Barbara Hershey, great actress. If you get the chance to watch it, it's well worth the watch. From the 81, I think it is. Um, here's here's the thing. Oh, uh, before I get into this really good, uh, it's that time of year my allergies are kicking my butt, so bear with me. Uh, in August of 1974, Harry Gaynor and a friend were in a bookstore in California. They were talking about their work in the fields of parapsychology and paranormal investigation. They were doing research at UCLA on the paranormal. In the next aisle, two women were looking at books on the paranormal. They overheard the conversation, and one of them, Doris Byther, told them that her house was haunted. She gave them her phone number so that they could come out and see it for themselves. Carrie Gaynor and parapsychologist Barry Taft came out. They went to her house. <clears throat> she lived in a little shack that had been condemned twice. She was barely making ends meet. She told them that she had been repeatedly raped by the ghost. They thought she was crazy, and they left. They, they referred her to a psychologist and blah, 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 blah. That was on August 22nd, 1974. Ten days later, she called them back saying that other people had witnessed some of these paranormal events. When they returned, they witnessed a number of things, including, well, okay, uh, her room was freezing cold while the rest of the house was warm. This is August in California. Her room was freezing cold. Uh, something like a 20 or 30 degree difference. Steady. Uh, there was the distinct, disgusting smell of rotted meat throughout the house. A lower cupboard, uh, a lower cupboard, eh, let me start that over. A lower cupboard door opened by itself and a skillet flew across the room and hit the floor. Doris told him that there were three entities that assaulted her. The two small ones would hold her down and the big one would rape her. She also told him that at one point an electrical breaker box had been ripped off the wall and thrown at her. Other people had witnessed these events. Doris Bither, Bither, excuse me, I'll get it right in a minute. Doris Bither had four children. The oldest one was a teenager. He said that he had witnessed her being attacked by nothing. When he tried to help her, he was thrown across the room. Taft and Gaynor <clears throat> had dozens of researchers in her house, and they all witnessed glowing balls of lime green light zipping around the room. The balls coalesced into the figure of a man's torso. It was an apparition, and it moved. It was animated. It moved. Uh, 25 people witnessed it, but it would not show up on camera. They were taking pictures. They had video recorders going. It would not show up on film. The researchers later witnessed pieces of, cup of cardboard being thrown at her. They had put cardboard on the walls so that they could gauge the, the speed of these orbs. They you know, put taped up uh, cardboard on the wall, black cardboard, and these the pieces of cardboard were being thrown at her. The researchers used a Geiger counter. When the activity was going on, there was no radiation. When it was inactive, there was normal background radiation. I thought that was weird. Doris Byther drank a lot. Many people said she had invented all of it because of the beer, but researchers actually witnessed it. So it was not a hallucination. It was not a hoax. They saw this stuff. 25 people witnessed it. If they're all involved in a hoax, that's a hell of a hoax. That's all I'm saying. Doris moved to another state, and the activity followed her. It followed her. She was very quiet and didn't tell anyone who she was or what was going on, but the activity spilled out into the two neighboring houses at her new place. 
Researchers recorded heavy breathing and footsteps, but did not hear it when they were recording it. So they had the recorder going, and when they stopped it and played it back, you heard the heavy breathing and footsteps. Doris moved several more times. And the activity continued to follow her. The rapes have become less frequent, but activity continued. This is one of the better documented cases of paranormal assault. The, the smell of rotting meat is a classic symptom of demonic activity. I've talked about that in at least one other video. Uh, the I think it was the Conjuring House video. I can't remember what it's called. But anyway, Doris Bither had a tumultuous, a, a tumultuous time during her teenage years being disowned and kicked out before she turned 18. She had four children by four different men and was divorced multiple times. This kind of bad life experiences are the fertile ground where demonic activity grows. It's an inn. People have bad life experiences. There's assault, there's violence, there's you know murders, things like that. That's where demonic activity thrives. That's where the, the that it gives them an open door to come in, essentially. Uh most cases of demonic possession follow abuse and this type of bad experiences. Doris was not possessed that we know of, but she, she certainly experienced paranormal events, including poltergeist activity and possibly demonic activity. That much is absolutely certain. And people, you, you hear about it today, oh yeah, it was all fake. It was, she just faked it all. She was a drunk. She was hallucinating. 25 people don't hallucinate the same thing. You cannot get a hallucination on film. They they film these orbs. They they didn't get the torso, but they got the orbs on film. You cannot you cannot film a hallucination. It doesn't work that way. Field haunting. For those of you who are not aware, um, uh, the infield haunting is also called the infield poltergeist. It was in uh, took place in England uh, back in the seventies. <clears throat> Many people are aware of this incident through the movie The Conjuring 2. Most of these people, most of the people who have seen this really great movie are unaware that it is based on a true story. In August of 1977, Peggy Hodgson, H-O-D-G-S-O-N Hodgson, called the police to her rented home at 284 Green Street in Enfield, London. She claimed that she had witnessed paranormal activity including furniture moving and knocking sounds in the walls. Um, two police constables investigated the calls because there were multiple calls. The first was a male constable who witnessed a chair wobble and slide across the floor but could not determine a cause. He actually put that in his police report. The second one was a female constable witnessed toys and other objects being thrown across the room. Um, one of them, one of the toys actually hit her. She also put this in her report. This is two separate calls. Over a period of 18 months, more than 30 people, including neighbors, psychic researchers, and journalists, witnessed furniture moving on its own, objects being thrown across the room, and Miss Hodgson's children levitating off the floor. Knocking noises, gruff disembodied voices, and other odd sounds were also recorded. One of the daughters, on several occasions, began speaking in an old man's voice. And the old man was pissed off, is all I'm saying. The voices identified themselves separately as Bill Wilkins and Joe Watkins. A slew of paranormal investigators were called in, most notably demonologists Ed and Lorraine Warren. They visited the home in 1978 and were convinced that the events had a supernatural explanation. There are some who claim that the entire case was a hoax. Um, an elaborate set of tricks instigated by the children. <clears throat> and, I don't know, I, I honestly can't say. However, this is what we do know. Two separate law enforcement officers witnessed objects moving with no discernible cause. There was no wires or ropes or anything. There was nobody around. A chair slid across the room. 
uh, toys were being thrown. One of them hit an officer. Regardless of whatever else may or may not have been faked, the two police constables' reports are above reproach. When objects move by themselves in full view of law enforcement personnel, you have to figure something paranormal is going on. I'm just saying. Do your own research and put your comments in the, in the, in the, under the video here in the, in the comment section. I'd love to read them and I'm sure everybody else would as well. <clears throat> There's a lot of people who really do believe that this was just an elaborate hoax. And, you know, I, if it wasn't for the law enforcement officers, because recordings of sounds can be faked. When... When you see children being levitated off the floor, when you when you when you witness things moving by themselves with no reason, no cause, yeah, that, that, there's something going on there. About a story that I heard a while back and did a little bit of research, turns out it's true. So here we go: the San Pedro haunting. There are stories all over the world about hauntings. Many of the stories are scary, but many of them, again, are total bullshit. Let's let's face it. There's a lot of hoaxes and a lot of uh, a lot of people enjoy making up stories. You know, on this channel, I try to do stories that are completely proven true or have a basis in fact. This is one of those stories. In 1989 through 1991, investigators checked out a house. They were investigating a house in San Pedro, California. The occupant, a woman named Jackie Hernandez, reported that unseen forces were terrorizing her and had attacked her multiple times. There's it, a, a more to it than that, but for the sake of the, of a, the length of the video, I'm going to shorten it, but she was being attacked by unseen forces. They were choking her and doing all kinds of stuff. So, throwing stuff at her, you know, that kind of thing. <clears throat> she also reported seeing apparitions of an old man and a corpse laying in her son's bed. That right there would scare the bejesus out of just about anybody. So anyway, they she called these people in and they went to investigate. The investigative team, led by Barry Taff, T-A-F-F, Taff, a renowned paranormal investigator, discovered a variety of abnormal occurrences including unexplained banging, and viscous fluid oozing from the wall. That fluid was analyzed and it turned out to be human blood plasma. The walls in this house were bleeding. Literally. But the worst was yet to come. <clears throat> the team went into the attic to investigate odd sounds. Okay, The woman felt that that's where the, the, the entity, whatever it was, had moved and so they went up there to investigate. They found nothing in the darkness. When they were getting ready to leave the attic, they heard muffled screams in the darkness. One of the investigators shot several photos in the dark with a, I, I assume he had a flash bulb or something. Uh, the pictures were horrifying. One of the team members, photographer Jeff Wheatcraft, was hanging from a rafter with, his, with, with a clothesline wrapped around his neck. The photographs clearly show the gruesome scene. The group was able to get him down and he has fully recovered. But the fact remains that some unseen force in that house tried to murder him. Whatever's in that house tried to murder a human, a living human person. That, that will shake you to your core. If you're not a believer, that will wake your ass up in a heartbeat. As an investigator, your job is to find out the truth no matter where the facts lead you. As a paranormal investigator, sometimes those facts lead you into dark places. Sometimes facts, when you're, when you're, when you're investigating a ghost or, or a haunting or something like that, some sort of a paranormal activity, sometimes the facts aren't real clear. It's pretty clear that whatever's in that house didn't want them there. 
Sometimes facts lead you into dark places. In the dark places is where evil dwells. Sometimes evil just wants to be left alone. And it's ready, willing, and able to kill to be left alone. That, that, that would be... That would be a, a traumatic event, and this this fellow Wheatcraft, Jeff Wheatcraft, uh, evidently he he has recovered from that. But I I can't see that not having an effect on him, lasting effect. Uh, if he ever went back into that house for the as part of that investigation, that is a that is a hell of a man right there. This thing tried to murder him. It's a non-corporeal entity that was able to try to strangle him, to hang him from a rafter. If you know, I, I, I try to go at this with a neutral perspective. You know, I don't know if there's ghosts or not, but here's what happened, and, and decide for yourself, kind of thing. That's pretty fucking plain. I'm sorry, I don't mean to sound disgusting or, or you know, pardon my foul language, but. I try to keep this, you know, as, as civil as possible. But that's that. It doesn't get much much more plain than that. Something in there wanted him out, and it was willing to kill to get him out. South Shields Poltergeist. Um, this is a relatively new story, but it's very scary nonetheless. <clears throat> For those of you who don't know, the word poltergeist. Great movie, by the way. But the word poltergeist means noisy ghost. Poltergeist cases are some of the most fascinating in the paranormal world. This one is scarier than most. A young couple and their son, and their young son were living in a beautiful terraced home in the gentle coastal town of South Wales in the United Kingdom. Their home life was idyllic until late 2005. In December of 2005, the family began to experience paranormal events that they could not explain. This is the way it always starts. The event started small, just like they always do. But they escalated until they became truly frightening. I could find nowhere in any article that I read about this the names of the couple or their child. So I'm not going to try to pry into their privacy. Obviously, they wanted to stay anonymous, which I completely understand. You start telling stories like this and people go, oh, they're crazy. You know, it could damage their reputation, their careers, that kind of thing. So I understand that. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to pry into their privacy. I'm, I'm just going to call in the couple, him and her husband and wife, that kind of thing. <clears throat> it started out small. Doors began opening and closing on their own. The couple rationalized this with wind gusts and such. You know, which normal... I understand that. Strange sounds began coming from the walls. This was attributed to the house settling. You know, you try to... In your mind, you try to rationalize things that are happening. Then, the events turned into things that couldn't easily be explained away. Furniture began moving around on its own, and they found kitchen chairs stacked on a table in the bedroom. Then a large, heavy chest of drawers was moved from one bedroom to another bedroom. In some cases, the furniture movement was seen or heard. Yeah, when you see or hear it, and there's nobody in the house but you, yeah, you... You know, something's up. Then, knocking, thudding sounds, and bangs could be heard getting louder and louder. Something obviously wanted to get their attention. Dramatic drops in temperature in specific rooms were very, very pronounced. And thing, and then, and, but all that's relatively benign. Then, things got more sinister. The poltergeist turns its, its attention to the child's toys. One night, the couple was settling down in bed when a stuffed animal hit the wife in the head. This was quickly followed by a second stuffed toy, which was thrown with much more force and ferocity. While they were trying to figure out what was going on, a flurry of other toys pelted them from all directions, coming from nowhere, and sometimes stopping in midair to redirect their course. So it's flying in, it stops and changes direction and goes after it goes a different direction. The couple could do nothing but hide under their covers. Then a vicious tug of war began as an unseen force tried to rip the blanket off of the bed. 
The husband suddenly screamed in pain as the attack ended. The wife found 13 red scratches down his back. Those scratches disappeared by the next day. Yeah, that encounter right there, I'd be moving. <laughs> I mean, I'm a, those of you who know me know I, I love my guns and I'm, I'm a gun person. I, I believe in the Second Amendment. What the hell's a gun going to do to that? You know, I am woefully inadequately prepared for that. All I can do is pray. And I believe in the power of prayer. But if that's my only option, I'm going to do it from outside the house. Just saying. After that, the strange entity began using toys to try and frighten the family even further. The rocking horse was found hanging from the ceiling loft hatch. The couple was met by a toy bunny at the top of the stairs. The stuffed animal was clutching a box cutter in its paws. Toys would roll across the floor on their own. Toys would make eerie moaning noises and turn on by themselves. Yeah, I started to hate those electronic toys after a while. When, when my son was small. Then, a sink in the bedroom, in the bathroom, excuse me, was found overflowing with blood, which then suddenly disappeared. The poltergeist also sent threatening messages on the son's doodle board and on the couple's cell phones, you know, via text. They were getting text messages from nobody. <clears throat> These texts were, were very ominous, like, you're dead, or just go now. Die, bitch. R.I.P. And go bitch now to your ma'am. On the doodle board, the messages were often supplemented by strange arcane shapes and symbols. None of the cell text messages could be traced to any phone or email account. It was crazy. Ghost hunters were called in to investigate. And these people witnessed many of the things that the couple reported. So it's, it's not a hoax when the people you call in to investigate see them. The investigators also witnessed a large black shadow lurking about the house. The shadow entity seemed to be aware they were investigating it because when they tried to take pictures of it, it was either gone or just didn't show up on the film. Yeah, that's that kind of when I read that part of the article, that kind of freaked me because I've, I've reported in my UFO videos that in, in the night sky where I work, um, I see lights in the sky. I do that a lot. And used to be on my old flip cell phone that we had, I could get photos of them and I could show people what I saw. My new cell phone, the iPhone that we have now, I can't do that. I can't get photos of it. They don't show up. That's something like this here. You try to get a picture of a dark shape hiding in the corner and it doesn't show up on, on, on the film or on the, on, the, on the recording. If it's a digital, obviously, they, they wouldn't show up. Um... It, 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 that 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 freaks me because it's that tells you it's intelligent and it doesn't want to be investigated. The investigators have confirmed everything the couple claimed, completely vindicating their story. The investigators even wrote a book about it titled "The South Shields Poltergeist: One Family's Fight Against an Invisible Intruder." I have not read that book, but I kind of want to. <laughs> One of those books that you read, you know, when when it's daylight outside. <laughs> a friend of mine asked me the other day uh, if I've had paranormal experiences do I believe in ghosts well, I don't know I honestly don't know uh, as far as UFOs uh, the UFO the, the, excuse me the, the Navy says that UFOs are real so you know who am I, who am I to argue with them they're, they're, the, they're the experts <laughs> as it were uh, so, uh, and I mentioned this in another video, I, I do see lights in the sky where I work, uh, they're fairly common, uh, they don't look like airplanes or helicopters or anything I've, I can identify, so they are technically un unidentified, and they're moving around in the night sky, so they're flying, and <clears throat> if they're emitting light, chances are they're an object, so unidentified flying object. Are they aliens? I have no clue. But I see them from time to time. Uh, on my old phone, I could get photographs of them. My old flip phone. They don't seem to want to show up on my new iPhone. The iPhone that my wife got. This thing here. Okay. 
Uh, I, I don't know why. They won't show up on those. I've taken multiple pictures of various different ones, and they don't show up. So, if they're not showing up on your phone when you take a picture of them, you know, take from that what you will, because that, that defies my logic. At any rate, <clears throat> so I, I do see stuff I can't explain. So, uh, as far as uh, ghosts or spirits or whatever, um, I used to work at the hospital in a little town called Clovis, and it's a, it's a great hospital. They do good work. Um, but I worked in housekeeping there years ago. And one night, I, I worked the evening shift. I used to get off around midnight or so. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so, uh, if you've ever been in the hospital in Clovis, you'll know what I'm talking about. They have the main entryway, and then over here they have, uh, it's not ICU, it's, uh, it's one of the wings where they keep, uh, uh, patients. They have rooms in there and the whole thing. It's one of the wards. And there's a hallway that runs across there. Uh, the, the front entryway is here, and the hallway runs all the way across, and it goes all the way down to pediatrics. I, I believe it was pediatrics. And anyway, there was a there was a, a time clock right there at the corner. And this, this other girl, and I, I was going to give her a lift home because she didn't have a ride. <laughs> so I'm waiting there. We're waiting by the time clock to clock out. And if you look down the hallway we were standing at, and you're, you're talking, and you, you look down that hallway, past the entryway is the gift shop. And beyond that, there's a, an exit that goes out into the patio, and we, uh, the, we called it the smoking patio, because that's essentially what patients and, and uh, employees used it for. It was essentially a little outside place where you could sit and relax and whatever. <clears throat> but uh, because they had that, they adopted that no smoking policy like every other hospital, you had to have some place to go to smoke. So at the time, that's where we smoked. I like a good cigar once in a while. Anyway, so we're standing there waiting, and down that hallway, you can see in front of the gift shop and beyond. Well, in front of the gift shop, a, a tiny little lady named, named uh, Irene was there and she picked up her bucket and she walked around the corner going out to the smoking patio and we both saw it Maria and I both and she said I didn't think Irene was working tonight and I said I don't think she was either that's weird huh so we waited and we clocked out and we we're watching we waited we clocked out and before we left we walked down to the to the uh, gift shop and beyond that made that turn where she went and we went out to the smoking patio. <clears throat> Turns out my fr other friend Michelle, m one of my co-workers, was there. And her, at the time it was her boyfriend, now it's her husband. They were out there. And I said, uh, Where, where's Irene? And she said, well, Irene is not here. She didn't come in tonight. And I said, we saw her. She came out here. And John was there too. And he said, no, no. Nobody came out that door. Not, not in 20 minutes or so. And I said, well, dude, we saw her. And you have to understand, there's no place else to go. Unless she did a Spider-Man Spider -Man up the wall and vanished through the ceiling, there's no place else to go. Okay, it's right there. There's only one door. So we, we, we had a chuckle about that and went on about our business. Because we know what we saw. There was two of us, we both saw it. Nobody made it up. Nobody's, you know. So anyway. <clears throat> Excuse me. Next night we go in, and there was a lady there named Bernice. She worked the later shift, and she came in, and I said, uh, Murray and I saw the weirdest thing last night. She goes, what do you mean? And so I go, I explained what we saw. She goes, oh, you saw, uh, what was her name? It was uh, Kumika, Kumika, I think her name was. I think she used the name Kumika. And I said, who's Kumika? And she goes, okay, let me explain. Kumika looked exactly like Irene from the back. You couldn't tell them apart from a distance. They're both tiny little older ladies, you know. So Kumika, and I, I believe that's the name. I'm going to use it because, you know, at any rate. <clears throat> Kumika 
had worked there for years and years and years and had retired. On the day after she retired, they called her into work because they were shorthanded, and she was so dedicated, she went in and worked. On that night, the night that one night, the night after she retired, she had, I want to say, a stroke and died and, and collapsed right there in front of the uh, gift shop. And so, and then they, they medevaced her out, and on the trip out, she died. That's my understanding of the situation. <clears throat> so, do I believe in ghosts? Maybe. I may have actually seen one. And I'm, I, I didn't make it up. I'm not, you know, it's not a hallucination because somebody else saw it. And there's corroborating testimony, you know, witness testimony, whatever, from uh, Bernie's. And so, anyway, that's that's my official ghost story. Now let's get on to the, i got two other quick stories to tell you. Um, my wife and my son, her whole family, as a matter of fact, are, uh, I, I hesitate to use the word mediums, sensitives, but they see things. Okay. And, uh since we got married there has been something in our house and I know that this is gonna sound weird but it's helpful it helps to find things uh, at one point um, my son when he was very very young was crying because he couldn't find this particular electronic toy that he liked and we were going through the house trying to find it we tore his room up we tore our room up we're, we're just looking everywhere and finally we're getting frustrated <clears throat> And my wife says, well, I'm going to go through his toy box one more time. I said, okay. So she sits in the middle of the floor, and she's going through his toy box. And I said, well, I'm going to go back and start in the kitchen and come this way. And look. She says, okay. So I go. I go look in the kitchen, and I'm looking through the rest of the place, and I can hear her in there rummaging through the toy box the whole time. So I finally make my way back to the bedroom. And my son has a number of toy boxes, so she's like on the third one. When I get there, and as I walk in the room behind her, sitting on the floor, is this toy that we've been looking for. It's right there on the floor. It's not a foot behind her on the floor. <clears throat> and I'm like, "Cool, you found it." She goes, "What?" I said, "Look, it's right there." She turned and looked, and she says, "Where'd that come from?" I said, "You must have found it in the toy box." She goes, "No, it wasn't me. That wasn't there when I left. I, I promise you, it wasn't." Um. So you know. <laughs> and there's a there's another story that that's interesting this is about midday and my wife and I and my son were at the house I had the day off from work and so I asked Hadrian I said do you want to go to the post office to get you know to get the mail and he said yeah sure so we go and we get it because I, I put him on my lap he likes to steer I, I'm I'm there of course but he likes to pretend like he's steering at the time he was very young so we went to the post office. We had a good time. We were gone maybe five or eight minutes or whatever. Because it's just down the road. <clears throat> and we live in a small village. So anyway, we go down there. And uh, we get the mail. And we come back. And he's excited because he drove. And so I'm getting out of the vehicle. And he jumps down. He runs out. And he swings that gate wide. He runs in there. Mommy, mommy, mommy. You know, five room. <laughs> and I've got the mail in my hand, and I'm shutting the door, and I'm going over there, and I should go behind him, shut the gate, and I can hear him in there talking to Mommy, and Mommy's talking back. Cool. No problem. So I go in there, and Hadrian is alone in the in the uh, living room. And he, I heard him talking to his mom, and I heard his mom talking back. They were laughing. So I go in, he's alone <laughs> in the living room. And... I can hear the shower running in the other room. So I go back in there and his mom's in the shower. And I say, baby, were you just in there? She goes, no, I, I got in the shower as soon as y'all left. I've been in here the whole time. I said, well, who's Hadrian talking to? She goes, what? So I go back in there and, and, and keep in mind, my, my son's very young. <clears throat> and uh, at the time, he's very young. And uh, he said, I was talking to the lady. I said, what lady? Well, she's not here now. So, well, where was she? She was in the corner. Who is she? I don't know. 
She's a nice lady. I see her from time to time. So, yeah. <laughs> That's enough to freak a parent right out. Um, but, like I said, whatever's in the house is helpful, beneficial, benevolent. So, we don't really mind that. When we find something we in, in a place where we've looked, we're looking for something and we look in place A and then later on we come back to look again and it's there. We, we offer our thanks to the helpful spirit, whoever it is or whatever it is. Uh, like I said, it doesn't seem harmful. So, you know. And now for the funny one. <laughs> this one's hilarious. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm going to work one night. And the, the road that I go down is a county road. It's very dark. It's got, there's a section of uh, trees that for some reason moonlight doesn't get in there. And it's, it's like, it's, it's, it's like an abyss. It's, there's no, it's like you're driving literally through an abyss. It's ridiculous. There's no light in there. There's nothing. And deer like to run out. So you slow down and you go through there. And so I'm driving, I'm driving towards that. I'm not there yet. I'm driving towards that. <clears throat> <Excuse me. clears throat> so, um, the, uh, there's, there's a road ahead and this road, or, yeah, and, and, and a vehicle comes out, turns, and gets onto the road ahead of me. And it's dark. All I can see is their lights. So, that's fine. No big deal. And because they made that turn, they're going slower than me. So, I'm catching up to them. I'm getting ready to start slowing down, you know. And I notice one of their tail lights is blinking on and off kind of erratically, not not in a steady pattern, just, you know, kind of thing. So anyway, <clears throat> uh, I get closer, and I notice there's something running along behind the car, and it was weird. I was like, holy crap, something's running along behind the car. So I slow down a little bit, and I'm behind it, and as I get a little bit closer, it looks like a person. There's a shadow of a person in the taillights. I'm like, crap. So I don't want I don't want to like if this person falls, I don't want to like, you know, run them over. So I slow down a lot. I'm, I'm behind them, even pace. And so as they pass under or excuse me, in front of a uh, farmhouse where there's a little bit more light right before we get to these trees, I catch the uh, a glimpse of what it is that's running along behind this car and it's all black. It's the shape of a person. But there's no features. It's all black. And <laughs> at night, where I'm at, as eerie as it is, oh my god, it looked like a demon chasing that car. It looked bad. It looked scary. So I slow down a bit. <laughs> you know. And they go on through this really dark area. It's eerie. And that and that every time you go through there, it sets your, you know, at night, it sets your nerves on edge. Because, you know, something's going to jump out in front of you. Or, you know, a deer or something. Or... You know, there's, it's, it's literally not good. Excuse me. Oh, check, check. Uh, so, <clears throat> I'm following these, this car. And she, th this car speeds up, so I speed up a little bit, you know. And uh, we go over the hill. And I'm going over the hill. And down there, they turn and park. So, I'm going past them. And it, I swear, there's a as I pass them, there's a black humanoid shape hanging on the back of that car. It looks like a demon hanging on the back of that car. And it, I, I got to work and I, and I, excuse me, there's a, this apparently cat wants to be on video. At any rate, it, I get to work and I'm, I'm kind of shaking a little bit, you know. Not shaking, but shaking a little bit. And I tell one of my coworkers about it. And I'm, I'm like, dude, it looked like a demon on the back of that car. That was freaky. He goes, you didn't stop? I said, oh, no, I didn't stop. I got a 37 Magnum. What's that going to do? <laughs> I'm sorry, but what the hell am I going to do? You know. <clears throat> and, of course, he looks at me like I'm crazy. Because it sounds like a crazy story. So... Uh, I want to say it's the next day or maybe the day after. I'm down here at the store here in the village. And I'm overhearing this guy talking about that night. And he says his wife was loading everything into the back of her hatchback. And 
she can fit everything in there. They're taking some stuff up to their storage there in, in Cimarron. And she can fit everything in there except for the dressmaker's dummy. And so, excuse me, he really wants to be on camera. So, <clears throat> she ties it onto the back of the vehicle, the back of the hatch, the hatchback, and she's going to drive it up there. Well, it keeps falling off and dragging along behind. <laughs> kind of makes you feel stupid, don't it? Uh, but it just goes to show you, usually there's, a, there's an explanation, even if it's absurd. There's usually an explanation for things that you see. Not everything is paranormal. Not everything is a demon hanging on the back of the car. <laughs> Sometimes it's, it's a simple explanation. What else can you say?